Uh, I mean, uh, so the relation between uh, WIN and IIT Bombay is uh, going strong, going well, and we can see great future ahead for, uh, for this collaborative effort. Uh, I, in, uh, so in, in IIT Bombay, I uh, do a lot of collaborative research, not only uh, within IIT Bombay, but with other institutes. And one of my collaborators had come here in summer, you might have heard him, uh, Professor Ramgopal Rao. Uh, he, uh, he gave um, uh, the lectures on the ca cantilevers, and although I, I have, have a significant interest in that and we do a lot of work together, we are incubating a company together, I'm not going to talk about that at all, because hopefully he has covered everything that there was to cover. I'm going to cover another aspect of my research which has, which has to do with optical waveguides. And uh, I also, as, I, as, as Simarjit mentioned, I am uh, right now heading the Center for Research in Nanotechnology and Sciences, which is a, a, a characterization utility, f a, a, a small fabrication and a huge characterization utility set up uh, in the IIT Bombay campus for use by academic and industrial users from all over India. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I start with this standard blurb. I think all of you have seen this many, many times, uh, so something like this. Uh, but the, I mean, I start off with the color of gold, which might be golden, maybe bluish, and maybe even red. And, and what is important is that the color of gold not only changes with the size, in the bulk it is golden, and as it go, goes smaller, it goes red, and all sorts of other colors. But more importantly, it changes drastically with what is around the gold nanoparticles. So that is the property which we are going to finally utilize. Uh, but uh, I mean, all this is really, really old wine. I mean, all these stained glass windows were made with these gold nanoparticles and so. And probably this, as we talk about this, this is, I mean, I love stained glass windows. I love going to churches just to take pictures of the stained glass windows because, I mean, they look wonderful. This particular stained glass window is one unique one in the world. Uh, can anyone say where this is from? Anyone have any idea? And or what is the unique nature of this, uh, uh, this, this thing? <coughs> Uh, no, it's not. It's, act it's actually from Cambridge, I think King's Chapel, as far as I recall. Now, in all other stained glass windows, like the previous one, these are religious. This one is scientific. There are pictures of eminent scientists and, uh, for that matter, um, uh, 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 people with the, uh, connected with the arts on this particular chapel, which is very, very surprising. But anyway, I mean, that's just an aside. Uh, the, the property of nanoparticles and the fact that they change color has been known for quite a while. I mean, these stained glass windows are like, what, 500 years old? The Lysergos cup was like thousands of years old, where, uh, you know, the, the property of gold, uh, or property of nanoparticles was exploited to give these cups this very pre peculiar property that, you know, uh, put a light inside it, it looks something else, put a, uh, uh, shine a light from outside, it looks something else. Um, so, how, what has all this got to do with sensors? So, now, of the, uh, in, a, in the past few decades, scientists have consciously and actively tried to control the processes at the nanoscale uh, and exploited the property of materials that exist only at this size. I mean, essentially, uh, the de development of nanotechnology has nothing to, I mean, it, it is not, uh, nanotechnology is not new, it's very old for that matter, but we are aware of nanotechnology because we, n we now can characterize and control the property, control things at the nanoscale in a sense. So, uh, the even before this hula buya about nanotechnology started, people have been using gold for various sort of clinical tests, like you know, all these typical detectors. Uh, you know, uh, if this one becomes uh, there, a line develops here. It is a control. This is a test, and uh, in in this one, the line has disappeared. So obviously, uh, that is negative. This one is positive. There's a con the control is lighted. So this are, these are all done with these nanoparticle sort of things. Now. Uh, so with that a little bit on the nanoparticles, I just uh, shift the gear a little bit and go into uh, what, uh, is, uh, what are the, these optical immunosensors, op optical sensors are about. So uh, people typically have used uh, these optical sensors in the, in the form of, uh, by putting some antibodies on that, on, a, on an optical sensor. Uh, Antigen and antibody interact, so antibody, antigen comes and sticks to the antibody. Sometimes, the, and, uh, sometimes there is a fluorescent marker which goes and sticks uh, the, uh, with, this, with the help of these reporter molecules. This obviously is a much more complex reaction. So what 
we try to do is we try to do, uh, do what is known as these label free sensors which use absorbance, reflectance or autofluorescence of uh, whatever is binding here or the fact that when the binding happens the uh, refractive index at the uh, very local zone almost the nanometer level zone changes thereby giving a different sort of light output. How? We will see in a few minutes. So the way one does it is one can you know, send in light, have the sample over here in a cuvette or something like that, sends the light over here, which is absorbance. One can send in light, look at the light at a right angle. Uh, but that happens if this, uh, this particular uh, sample over here fluoresces. There is now in, uh, in, in both of these methods, uh, light actually passes through the sample. Now that gives a problem because if the sample contains dust or other interfering species, uh, my test is compromised. There is another format of the test of uh, making such uh, sensing devices which uses what is known as the evanescent waves. Now, uh, so consider this to be an optical fiber. Everyone knows what an optical fiber is. Light passes from one end to the other. Uh, and uh, light passes from one end to the other uh, by uh, total internal reflection. That, that does not mean that all the power is confined within the waveguide. I will use the word waveguide and optical fiber almost interchangeably in the next few slides. I will consider them both uh, to, be, uh, to, be the, uh, to be the same uh, 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 insofar as the present few slides are concerned. So some of the power leaks out. And that is the evanescent wave, which is a non-propagating wave which surrounds the optical fiber. I mean, this is grossly exaggerated. The extent of this evanescent wave is grossly exaggerated over here. It only goes to, about, uh, to a few nanometers. The thumb rule is about one-tenth of the wavelength, uh, wavelength of light that is coming in. So we can actually put some, and now the extent of the power in the evanescent wave depends on the refractive index of the immediate surroundings of the waveguide. So if I stick an antibody on the waveguide, and so the refractive index on the immediate surrounding changes, therefore the evanescent wave power changes. If the evanescent wave power changes, that means the light output is going to change. If an antigen comes and attaches to the antibody, the same thing happens all over again. Again, the um, uh, refractive index locally changes, and the output power of the light changes. So uh, we have developed a whole bunch of different sorts of sensors using, using this and coupling um, gold nanoparticles on this. We are coming to that in a minute. So uh, I mean, so uh, just like the free fiber, we can also take, um, 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 make uh, optical waveguides on a chip uh, using silicon dioxide or various polymers. I'll talk about how we have used polymers to further our, our cause in this, in this regard. <coughs> So uh, we have used what is known as a property of uh, localized surface plasma resonance. Okay, so why does the gold red at nano, nano scale? Because the, it, uh, a phenomenon called localized surface plasma resonance happens. So that is uh, a sort of energy confined around the gold nanoparticle, which, uh, due to which light is absorbed and only red light is transmitted. So uh, uh, as a result, when you look at this gold nanoparticles uh, in, in a solution, it looks red. Now, if the surroundings of this gold nanoparticle changes, I mean the refractive index changes, a different color of, um, color of light is actually transmitted. And uh, so uh, you, it, it might start looking bluish or purplish. Uh, people have used these colorimetric gold nanoparticles in various formats, uh, mostly bound on glass or some sort of a, su a substrate, and looked at the change of color on a strip. Uh, that, is, that is the typical format in which people have used it. Uh, people have found various, you know, uh, there are uh, time-dependent changes in SPR because uh, continuously uh, this binding of uh, these, um, these antigen-antibodies or different sorts of biomolecules happen on the gold nanoparticle surface. Therefore, the, uh, you know, this sort of a, a curve can be seen as sigmoidal where uh, it, it finally goes, uh, goes and saturates. Ah, before I forget, I mean, so, uh, so all that was other people's work. Uh, this, these are the, actually all the people who do the work, and this is the guy who uh, goes about talking about that work, uh, and uh, actually doesn't do anything himself but, but talk. So uh, um, I mean, there are, uh, some of these people have graduated and left. Some of these people are still there with me, and 
probably if I, if I take the picture of the group now, it is going to be like year wide. Uh, and uh, in this work, of course, uh, some, some faculty colleagues like Professor Tapanandu Kundu from physics and Professor Anil Kumar from chemistry has had a significant role to play. Okay, so coming to glass optical fibers. So, the, uh, so this is how it came about. So one uh, couple of people came to me and said, you know what, I was working in this MEMS area, cantilevers and all that, and I don't know why they, they had to come to me, but they did, and it was very good that they, that they did. Uh, because that opened up a completely new vista of work to me. Uh, can you can you do this? Uh, we want to send some bacteria in water. I said, okay, I, I have all these cantilevers. No, we don't want to do cantilevers. Uh, so what do you want to do? We want to do optical. I said, okay. So let me let me read up a little bit about it and let me get back to you. So I found that well, you know what. Uh, we can do that, and we can do that. Uh, I was confident about doing that because we had a way to s functionalize the surface of these, uh, of all these optical fibers and things like that very easily. I mean, we had developed some techniques, and uh, we thought that okay, so we'll give them a, a way to sense bacteria in water. Actually, they they wanted to test. This is this is. Uh, I mean, this is totally crazy. I mean, this is what globalization is about. So uh, their problem is, you know, when ships come to Canada or USA. And they unload their stuff here. Uh, so what do they do to maintain the ship's level? They, they take in water. So that's called ballast water into the ships. And so they're going, going, and in India, they want to again fill up the ship with materials. So they dump that water in the Indian coast. So now there might be some bacteria or whatever in the Canada coast, which the fish near India might not like. So that's a problem. I mean, so they want to test the ballast water before actually discharging it. Uh, I never knew such a problem existed. I mean, I, I thought ships carry around sand uh, as ballast, but apparently they, they use water. Uh, so, well, so uh, the, the idea is that I, I don't like uh, techniques where you have to put a fluorescent label and things like that, because at the end of it, uh, some, sh uh, some ship uh, you know, crew member is going to do that, and if you tell him to, you know, mix this and that, and that and that, and five different types of processes before the sensing happens, then most probably it is going to be used for about five days, and after that they'll say, ah, too much trouble. Okay, so uh, the idea is to give a, give a, almost a single step process, the, and the only way that can be done is by using label-free sensing methods. No fluorescent labels, no nothing. You give the sample. I give you the result. That sort of a, uh, instrument has to be constructed with that philosophy. So now we started designing this uh, optical fiber probe-based uh, sensor where uh, we took a probe and uh, so, the, so optical fiber has a cord and a cladding around it. Uh, and so we removed the cladding in a part of the sensor, uh, in a part of this optical fiber, and we put uh, these antibodies on the surface uh, at the, uh, on the cord over here. And we stuck that whole thing into a little flow cell, put light through here and a spectrometer on this side, and tried to see what happens as the antigen-antibody binding happens on the surface of this. And uh, this picture is obviously a cartoon. I thought that I'll take this picture because it just looks more groovy. Uh, we do not use green light. Uh, I mean, uh, not for these experiments anyway. We use uh, UV. But uh, you cannot see UV in this, so I, uh, I put a green light and took a picture just to, just to make it look nice. And uh, uh, so light is going in through here. Uh, yeah, you can see this, uh, this thing curving out. How can you see this green light over there? It's supposed to be totally internally reflected, right? There should not be any light coming out of the fiber. That is because of the evanescent wave. Okay, uh, that is because of the evanescent wave that you see that light green thing around it. Okay, anyway, uh, so uh, there's a flow cell, maybe some of you might be able to see a very light thing over here. It goes in, comes out, goes, goes through here. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of absorption over here because you don't see this green color over here. Okay, uh, green light going in. Almost white light coming out. No, not, not white light coming out, but actually the, 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 the light has been absorbed very significantly, so you don't see that strong color anymore. So uh, we had a straight fiber on uh, like, this, uh, you know, like this previous thing. We had a straight fiber on which uh, we had stuck these anti uh, antibodies. Now, 
So we tested it with some proteins. Okay, and it worked beautifully with proteins. So we were sending in 280 nanometers uh, wavelength light through the fiber, and uh, 280 nanometers is a nice wavelength because all proteins absorb at 280 nanometers. Okay, and we stick the antibody on the surface to make, make it specific to a protein, and uh, the things uh, this, uh, so we can use this 280 nanometers. Uh, so there's a little problem here. The 280 nanometer, the wavelength, so the evanescent field is going to be about 28, 30 nanometers, maybe 50 nanometers at a, at a stretch. Uh, proteins, good enough. But what do these guys wanted to test, uh, test the ballast water for? Bacteria. And how big are bacteria? Like a micron. Okay, so a very small part of the bacteria is actually in the evanescent field. So, the, I mean, this thing could not sense a single bacteria. I mean, I, we dosed the water with trillions of bacteria and it still could not see a single one of them. So it was very, very uh, well, upsetting, to say the least. Uh, so we thought, uh, I mean, so uh, we obviously figured out why it was happening, because the evanescent field was not, was not penetrating deep enough. So how do we make the evanescent field go further? We actually taper the fiber or bend the fiber. Uh, for various logistical reasons, we decided we'll bend it. And this is what happens when you bend it. I mean, this is, this is not to scale again. I mean, uh, the straight fibers, evanescent field, the depth of penetration and the strength of the field is low. The bent fibers, the depth of the field you know, goes up. Actually, it goes up, you know. The, if this is, this is over here, this goes through the roof. Uh, so obviously, the bacteria is like this, you know, the big fella. So if I can send the field up to here like this, then that, that field is going to cover or is going to interact with a significant part of the bacterium cell. So the, when that, okay, so how do we bend it? We put it to a candle. Okay, put it to a candle and bend it. Now, very easy to say, extremely difficult to do. Uh, uh, because these fibers are like 200 micron and they are glass. Uh, glass, as it is, glass breaks very easily. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, but, but then again, uh, and for, for uh, doing very difficult things, you have students. Okay, so the uh, students uh, sat there and figured out exactly how much pressure they can put and, you know, after, after breaking about um, 100 meters of fibers, uh, they finally, uh, finally they figured out how to uh, make it reproducibly. And that, uh, I mean, so now, I mean, they, they can just, oh, you want to bend fiber? They'll bend it and give it to you. Okay, so uh, thank, thank goodness that they, they could figure out how to do it. But then again, I, I, don't, I don't like that method very much. Uh, it's still, uh, uh, I'll come to how we, have, we are trying to overcome that, uh, that method in a few minutes. Okay, so now that was 280 nanometers. Okay, now 280 nanometers is good, but then we thought, okay, you know what? Those gold nanoparticle fellows are there whose color changes if things happen around it. So let's see if we put these gold nanoparticles on these fibers and let's see whether, you know, uh, things start happening over there. Uh, so uh, it developed, a, uh, we developed as an alternative to a UV absorbance based sensor. The working principle is det detection of the refractive index changes. Okay, so now we are not absorbed, the evanescent field is, uh, power is not getting absorbed by the bacterium, but the bacterium is changing the refractive index around the gold nanoparticles. And remember the color of gold changed when we put different sucrose or different refractive index material around it. So uh, this absorbance uh, of GNP is sensitive to the surrounding medium. Optical properties GNP coupled with the efficient trans transducers, we still, I mean, we decided we won't go back to the straight probes ever again because the U-band probes are so much better. And my students were so good at bending them. Um, uh, so uh, we took these fibers and uh, put some, I mean, so how do we, attach these gold nanoparticles to these fibers. I mean, that's a, that's a problem. I mean, why will gold sit on that fiber? We can do a physical adsorption, but that's, I mean, you put some water in it, it just flows away. Uh, so uh, we uh, took that, uh, took the fiber, um, dipped it in acid, uh, sulfochromic acid, to create these um, hydroxide groups on the surface. Then we subject it to uh, amino silane which creates amine groups and on the and gold has this affinity not only uh, gold has a very strong affinity to thiols uh, SH groups but it also has a nice uh, low level but a pretty reproducible affinity to amine groups as well so uh, once we dipped it in a gold nanoparticle suspension uh, these gold nanoparticle uh, suspension got 
neatly stuck to the surface, and particularly because these gold nanoparticles were stabilized with citrates. So once we have that, I mean, this is this is what we have. We have this, you know, little flow cell. Um, uh, uh, we have a LED, um, uh, and we send it in, uh, put it out to a spectrometer. We monitor it while the gold nanoparticle absorbs uh, uh, the surface functionalization is going on, and we see that you know it is getting functionalized nicely. And if we look at refractive index sensitivity, we see that it is it is actually quite quite sensitive. I mean, these are these are very raw data, as you, as you can see. So there is a lot of noise. There is no smoothing of the data uh, here. Uh, so we have got uh, various levels of uh, uh, you know without without any sucrose. That means just water. There is you know it's flat. After that, as we add sucrose more and more, remember the gold nan the, around the gold nanoparticle, it absorbs very strongly at around the green, blue, that sort of color. So this, we see a significant absorption over here at that 550 nanometer range. Mm. And, and if we uh, compare the two, then we see that uh, actually the, um, the gold nanoparticle type of things produce a far, far stronger uh, response uh, than, the, uh, than the bare uh, fibers on which gold nanoparticles are not there. And uh, we try to optimize uh, how, how much should we bend it, what should be the size of the nanoparticles, what should be the um, uh, extent, uh, I mean, how, how many nanoparticles should be there on the surface. And we see that actually there is an optimal bending diameter, uh, which is about uh, 0.75 uh, millimeter uh, radius of this bending, which gives us the best, best uh, results. Uh, uh, but that also depends on the dia of the of the fiber. If the uh, um, fiber is 100 micron dia, and, uh, or 400 micron dia, that the bending optimized bending diameter changes. Mm. Now uh, we typically use the 200 microns because that's a uh, thinner the fiber, the better. But 100 microns break easily, break more easily. And we look at the. Uh, effect of the core diameter, uh, the, the, when we look at the effect of the core diameter, we see that uh, and the, actually the 200 micron produces one of the best uh, uh, results uh, uh, overall in terms of refractive index sensitivity. And so now the question is, so when you bend it, uh, why does the sensitivity increase? I mean, even the bare bent fibers are better than the bare straight fibers. Why does, so evanescent field increases, that is number one. Number two, once the light passes through the bend, the modes change. So our expectation was if the modes are changing there, we'll, we'll have all those changed modes over in this region. So let's, you know, everyone, people are greedy. I mean, scientists are the greediest of the lot. They have something, they want to make it better. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we, okay, so what we'll do, we'll send in light through here and increase the length on this side. So all those changed modes will interact with, uh, um, uh, with uh, the light and so we'll get a higher sensitivity. Unfortunately, that did not work according to, I and mean, there are always reverses. Uh, we saw that uh, instead of this, actually the probe ratio, of, or where the, I mean, the input side and the output side are the same, that has finally the, almost the best sensitivity mm, uh, in a sense. So we did not get uh, uh, too good a uh, mm, uh, output in terms of uh, changing uh, the ratio of the size of the, sizes of the input arm and the output arm. So we also, another thing that we need to look at is how much gold nanoparticles should be there. Uh, so uh, how, uh, or how much is too much? Uh, we, did, we did do that and we saw that actually after a while it saturates. The uh, refractive index sensitivity sort of saturates. So this is about the time when, uh, so the, uh, uh, when I say GNP chemisorption unit, this is a very weird unit one of my students have come up, uh, come up with. I, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so this, this unit is the optical density of the gold nanoparticle solution in which this thing is being dipped, okay? It has nothing to do with, the, uh, with uh, any, any property of the fiber or what is happening, uh, what is happening there. I mean, so, uh, so we have, we saw, what we saw is that about, at about three optical density, if we dip the fiber in there for, uh, for this 30 minutes or so, it gives us the best, uh, I mean, it gives us the, a result after, after which nothing, uh, I mean, even at four optical density, it does not get any better. So this is how it looks like. Uh, uh, the, this is, this is, a, uh, this is a, a fake same image of uh, 
um, of gold nanoparticles coated on uh, on the fiber. I mean, it's a difficult one to take uh, as, as, uh, simply because the fiber is mounting the fiber on a on a same stage is is, is quite a, quite a job. <coughs> uh, so these are all. Uh, um, so uh, this one obviously this is um, the uh, dipping time is like five minutes. So not many of them have uh, come uh, uh, come onto it. T2 and T3 are 60 minutes, both uh, uh, 30 and 60 minutes. This one and this one, and we see that this is this is not not too bad at all. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, so what we uh, at the end of it the percentage uh, coverage we can we have to go at least 30 minutes. 60 minutes is okay. I mean, it, it increases it to, to, to a decent degree, but not, uh, not uh, as, I mean, it definitely does not double it up. So there is a sort of saturation effect going on. So uh, anyway, so the, uh, when we uh, do this, after that we subject it to different refractive index uh, solutions. And uh, that, is how, that is how we essentially uh, test it out. Uh, we saw, again, that GNP came is our uh, or or uh, this thing is coming up, uh, where the change in absorption, as we can see, at, at about 3, that has sort of saturated out, the, the response has sort of saturated out. Now, how, to convert it, this whole thing to a biosensor, what we need to do is we need to attach these antibodies onto these gold nanoparticles. So, this is a gold nanoparticle, on which there is an antibody to which an antigen or an analyte, something like that, is coming and sticking. Uh, and this is what we see. We see that uh, the absorption at 540 nanometers, it shows a very nice uh, um, first order sort of uh, reaction. And uh, this one uh, below here, this NSB or non-specific binding, that means that you know, whatever uh, unregulated binding that we might see with, uh, with different analyte molecules, which is not supposed to bind to the surface, we still have some of that binding because of simple physical absorption. But the non-specific binding is very low. This non-specific binding, the concentration of this particular molecule was at this level. So 15 micrograms per mil uh, actually was there, but it is, it is, it has less than a, a tenth of the response. I mean, even 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 less than that. Uh, actually, less than one hundredth of the response. Uh, we use this to detect not only proteins but uh, E. coli bacteria. And uh, we can see that uh, we can we can detect uh, uh, this is this is the spectrum uh, spectrum, but these are these are actually better uh, better pictures of that. So what what okay? So now one of the things that we uh, we noticed was since all of these was a very surface related phenomena, so whatever was there not bound to the surface does not actually affect our results very much. So the time resolved. Uh, evanescent wave absorbance values due to binding at F of FITC. So, I mean, we are binding the um, uh, E. coli molecules on the surface just fine. Um, uh, now, at, uh, if we do it at 280 nanometer, we, we get some of some changes. We have, we have gone back to the 280 for a, for a few, few minutes. But uh, this, this is uh, even, even better. Now, where uh, we, we look at the time resolved response, uh, th this is at 280 nanometers. This is not using the gold nanoparticles, however, um, but uh, I mean we have got uh, got some very very decent E. coli uh, detection curves uh, on this. Although it does not go down to like one or two E. coli per mil, but that is more uh, because we cannot have the, the. I mean, so we have this problem. Okay, so there we have a flow cell. We are tr putting the analyte into it. We have the fiber in the middle. The E. coli is flowing right over the fiber and going away. So how do we make the E. coli come and sit on the fiber? If it comes and sits on the fiber, I can detect it. So that is that is uh, that is our problem. But uh, we are. I mean, there are, there are some some ways that we can actually start resolving uh, those issues by uh, by making the system more complex. Uh, now, with the gold nanoparticles, we had a, uh, we almost have a home run because we can use that to detect even. Uh, and uh, even uh, vapors, and particularly vapors of explosive molecules. So we subjected, uh, we functionalized the gold nanoparticles and uh, subjected to some TNT vapors, uh, went to a high explosives lab and you know, took this thing and had a little vial of TNT open under it, and immediately it started responding. So we can detect, uh, and that this, this thing is starting to respond in about, uh, uh, in about this, this, this time. I mean, it's, it's pretty fast, the response is pretty, pretty fast. 
it's about in um, about five five minutes or so. It is not instantaneous yet. Uh, and we uh, we functionalized it and uh, subjected to vapors of RDX, and same thing. I mean, we we see a very good response at at this 550 nanometer uh, sort of uh, sort of range, and we see this absorbance change as time goes by. So, I mean, both of these are uh, are, are very. Int uh, uh, I mean, essentially, these gold nanoparticles are providing us a whole wide range of applica applications around both chemical uh, or uh, water-based or fluidic sen fluid-based sensing, or and even this gaseous vapor sort of sensing. So uh, it uh, essentially, uh, so this is this is TNT or RDX, which is not heated up. So just a vial is opened in front of it. So the, the percentage of this uh, uh, or the amount of uh, particularly RDX, the, uh, the vapor pressure in, in uh, room temperature is very, very low. Uh, it's at the PPB, PPT range. Uh, so uh, it can detect uh, those vapors in, in any carrier gas. Uh, however, the molecule that is used here, the called 4 MBA, which is a very routine molecule that has been used by a lot of people for looking at explosive sensing, is not very selective. Uh, I mean, one of the very well-known researchers who have actually from, come from USA to Canada and is now a faculty in the University of Alberta, who developed the, uh, one of the first uh, these uh, uh, portable explosive sensors, a person called uh, Professor uh, Thomas Thundert, uh, so he had developed this little USB stick sort of sensor which he sent out and after about a few days people st stopped using it. Why? Because it sensed RDX, it sensed TNT, it also sensed shoe polish. Okay, so if, if a soldier had polished his shoe really well, it will start beeping. Okay, so obviously uh, the people don't, so one has to, the. Uh, the we need to develop receptors which have to, which exhibit higher selectivity to this particular explosive. So we have the transducer, essentially. A very good transducer in the form of gold nanoparticle coated optical fibers, but we don't have the ideal receptors. So there are some people from chemistry and who are working on that. Let's see what happens. So now, so I have these 200 micron fibers which are flopping around. Very difficult to actually put them together and align them and you know, on the field we can develop some cartridges which does work, but there should be a more elegant solution to it. So uh, we developed some uh, embedded polymer waveguides. The beauty of this waveguide is that, okay, uh, so uh, this is the injection input channel, uh, input port, this is the output port, I, I can have a sort of waste reservation, uh, I mean waste area around this. Uh, this serpentine thing that you see here, uh, I have a larger picture of it right over here. Uh, what you see in white here is this polymer called SU8, uh, which is a standard photoresist, can make very high aspect ratio structures. What you see in black here uh, is this is sort of empty space, so it is like the micro channel. The beauty of this is that uh, we have made the waveguide into uh, the uh, part of the wall of this microchannel. Therefore, when we send light in uh, through this waveguide, the evanescent wave directly is in the microchannel over here. So whatever happens in the microchannel in around that, uh, the surface of this bend, we can sense. And uh, we can al also do some electrophoresis by using, by putting some voltage uh, here, we are not going to get into that today. Uh, so uh, once we do that, uh, we subject it to um, uh, various sorts of tests. Um, we do a dye test, which is injecting some dye in it and see how that absorption changes with the concentration of dye. This is what we see over here. And uh, we subject it to, uh, if we uh, change the refractive index of the solution that is passing through this, how does it change? Again, it, it shows a very nice linear response. Uh, and, but you see, here the, here the big problem is that this whole white thing is SU8, and SU8 absorbs. SU8 is, it is not a very transmittive, meaning polymer. So we need to, what we thought was, okay, let me change the length of this SU8. Okay, so, uh, achha, uh, so now how do we couple light into these waveguides? So we have these little V grooves over here into which we stick fibers in. Okay, so light gets coupled very efficiently into this waveguide. Now, so we reduced the length of this SU8 and made this little C sort of 
uh, shape over here. So, the this only this part is SU8, light is coming in uh, using a fiber through this, coupled over here, goes through this, com comes back and puts a, uh, into a sensor. And we see that the results are, I mean, this, uh, the strength of the signal goes up by leaps and bounds. I mean, by this is, this is with uh, that U bend, this is with this uh, C bend. Uh, and I, I'm not going to get into the fabrication procedure. Uh, now, so SU8 is an epoxy. So, we can modify the surface of the epoxy to accept biomolecules and attach biomolecules. By, uh, we, we have ways by which we can directly implant amine groups on the surface of, of this epoxy by cracking ammonia on the sur near the surface of it. We have various other wet methods in order to um, uh, modify the surface of SU8. And, uh, we can do vapor phase silanization or liquid phase silanization and use gold nanoparticles on, on this, in this format where the gold nanoparticles are stuck to this, uh, to this bent region of this SU8 waveguide. And uh, we see that this is what we see. We see as we change the sucrose solutions, the, it goes up. I mean the absorbance of, uh, goes up. Uh, and if we uh, try to, I mean, we, we are not going to get into this too much. Um, and uh, we use it for various sensors and just, the, it is not, the change between the bare SU8 waveguide and the gold nanoparticle coated SU8 waveguide is not as dramatic as the optical fiber, uh, the, the free optical fibers, but still, I mean, we can see that there is almost a doubling of the response if we coat the SU8 fibers with, with gold nanoparticles, particularly with respect to refractive index sensitivity. Uh, again, use the GNP on top of it put um, antibodies, let the antigens come and bind to the antibodies, and this is what we see, where we have um, a, a period, uh, as, we, as we inject higher and higher concentrations of these proteins, it keeps on, on the, the response keeps on increasing. Uh, our minimum sensitivity levels are about 0.15 micrograms per mil. And knowing this, we obviously can, um, uh, we can uh, look at enzyme substrate interactions, we can look at DNA hybridizations and, of course, the antigen antibody or the pathogen antibody interactions. Thank you. A lot of it is diffusion limited. So, uh, okay, uh, we, have a, we have a flow channel uh, which is of the order of, let's say, a few millimeters. Uh, we have the, which is of the order of, of, uh, of a few hundred microns. So, uh, we are sending in the analyte through this whole flow channel. Not only the sensor does not get to see all the analyte molecules, but also there is a, uh, there is a uh, diffusion of these analyte molecules towards the sensor. So, if you look at this, uh, the curves, it is typically a diffusion rate limited uh, in the, uh, interaction. How do you reset the sensor after you protect? You don't. In biological, I mean, our, it's use and throw. Uh, you, uh, we can. Uh, we have shown that in this optical fiber type of sensors, we can regain about 85 percent of the activity uh, by uh, subjecting it to some, some sort of acid which knocks out the, the, anti, uh, the antigens. But uh, since most of these are going to be used with medical cases, uh, uh, that is not our, uh, they will not allow us to reset the sensor anyway, so we are not even looking at that. Uh, some literature suggests that 30, 40 nanometers is the best optimal size, so we have used that. So now shape is something we are working on. So nanorods, nanoprisms, nanohexagons, yes. Do so you think that the prisms probably be better to Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because? because? Actually, the, the prisms will be, will be even, will be better because uh, it has two surface plasma modes. Okay, so it has a, it has a, uh, uh, I mean, the, and the two modes are different. So that is why it is going to be better. I'm, I'm quite sure it is going to be better. It's just that we have to manufacture those prisms. Uh, 
change, change in the plasma on absorption, yes. Peak, like intensity, not right. wavelength. Um, uh, the, uh, yes, it is the, the the wavelength shift we had expected initially started expecting that there is going to be a wavelength shift, but it has not happened very significantly. Although if you look at it very closely, there is a slight shift, very slight, about uh, about five eight nanometers worth. Okay. I mean, uh, we are not seeing a very significant uh, movement over there. Okay. Because uh, we have to also understand that. Uh, here, the interaction is giving rise to a refractive index change of micro RIU. Uh, whereas, uh, when we put, uh, I mean, the, the initial, the pictures that were shown where, you know, you have those gold nanoparticles and you put different uh, sucrose solutions, there the refractive index change is of the order of 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. It changes from 1.33 to 1.38. RIU, refractive index units, whereas in this antigen antibody binding, it changes from 1.33 to 1.33001, you know, that sort of, a, it's, a, it's about 3 to 4 micro RIU change. So the changes in the refractive index are almost negligible, right? Changes in the refractive index are, you, you have got me there, yes, the changes in the refractive index are very small, so however, the plasma change? absorbence change. So what is that changing the intensity? No, the in What is changing the absorption? Right, so uh, that's why I said I, you, you, you did get me there. Uh, the, um, uh, the, okay, let me go back to those lots. Very nice, uh, great question. This is this is like a this is like a spectrum. Okay, so one thing that is that probably is happening around around that is the the overall size in which the uh, the plasmon uh, resonance band is working. That that probably is changing because the local uh, there is a refractive index and there is an absorption of the LSP or elicited response. The LSPR is giving a, giving rise to an a, to an absorption or a change in the that 540 nanometer range. That is also changing. So that change is more prominent in these. Although if you look at it very closely, there is a slight change. I mean, this is a little noisy. There is a there are uh, smoother pictures. If you really smoothen it out, there there will be a slight shift in the in the in the peak. We looked at that. It did not come out very prominently. Uh, that's true. Mm, that's another one also. Yeah, I mean here the here the peak uh, shift is is even slightly the better understood. I mean there is a slight peak shift from here. And this is uh, yeah even even in this one. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we we get mono or bi. We have optimized the process to get a mono layer or maximum of a bi layer. So you use what kind of silanes do you use? Aptes. Uh, APTS. APTS. Maybe I yeah. I mean, uh, what what we do is that we don't. Uh, 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 we almost dry the surface. Yeah, that's what we have. Almost dry the surface, and whatever moisture is there strongly adsorbed to the surface, that is what we use for the polymerization. Uh, so that is, that, I mean, we tried other ways in which there were clumps. Yeah, that's um, what yeah. we so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that also, I mean, they'll form clumps here and there. So, I mean, we get very smooth surfaces by almost driving out, the, driving out all of the water and just use the strongly adsorbed water. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, so, 
know, again, this is a, a series of uh, lectures which is, uh, is getting really popular. One, because uh, well, we're bringing world class people here, but they're starting to link a certain group of people. So I can see there's chemistry and physics and other people in the audience, but there's that common link if it's sensing or if it's nano that we see. So at the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, bringing world class people, trying to raise the scholarship with that particular community is what we're trying to do here. So it's really good that you've come out and uh, I just want to thank Dr. Mukherjee uh, with a small gift. Of course, there's something probably to hold your tea and other things in here, but the most important part is the sought after bag that everyone keeps asking us for. But anyway, thank you so much. Okay, All right, thank you. thank you very much.